Hi, my name is Lola Palomo, I'm an art historian and a singer, and today I'll be speaking to you about the art of the Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, the Medici, there's many names and many moments in history that talk about the Renaissance. And I'd like today to focus on the paintings and what they have to tell us about this time of rebirth, of humanism, of the patronage system for the arts. So stick around and see what was going on in the early Renaissance, in the Trecento and Quattrocento time. See what the paintings have to tell us and learn about how humanism and the patronage system basically has created what we understand as art today. So stick around and learn a little bit more about Da Vinci and his friends of the Renaissance, the Rinascimento as it's called. So let's talk about the Renaissance. Today I'll be speaking about the Renaissance in Italy during the 14th and 15th centuries because that's the beginning of what we will know later on as the Renaissance, which they themselves coin the name. So the rebirth, rinascimento, of the old Greco-Roman ideas. Now these ideas, especially Roman written work, and that was translated from the Greek, was present in other parts of the world, in the Arab world especially, but it was rebirthed or refound by the Europeans, especially first in the Ital Italian parts and then later on in the north. So this came about the idea of humanism or many of the non-religious ideas started to develop once again. And the other part that is going to create the building blocks of the Renaissance is, in one word, money. So the Italian peninsula and its city-states developed extremely in terms of commerce and a lot of wealth was accrued. And this wealth brought in the need for legitimizing a society, a, a social society, which was this, com this commercial society, the Medici, the Sforza later on. So this new society in Italian city-states needed a way to be legitimized and they used artwork to legitimize themselves in their own cities and in the world. So these two elements are the, like the pillars of the Renaissance. Now let's go into the artists that built off of these pillars. And the first artist that we're gonna see is called Giotto, Giotto di Bodoni, who was an artist of the Trecento time, one of the earliest Renaissance painters. And there's two main things that we're gonna see in his artwork. One very, very evident one is expressivity or individuality in his figures. And the other one is volume. So before that, remember in the Middle Ages, we had images of many religious uh, people and saints and everybody was in a way presented in a flat or two-dimensional figure and Giotto is going to change that. Let me show you for example the Srovegni chapel. By the way all of the artwork that I'm going to be showing you was paid by patrons. So the patronage system is as I said at the beginning one of the pillars of the Renaissance. So Giotto was um, given this task to paint on the Srovegni chapel frescoes on the life of Christ and the life of Mary. And as you can start to see, there is an individuality in these figures. You start, for example, to see um, there is some kind of interest to show emotion, be it anguish, be it interest. It starts to develop much more than it was before. Now we're coming from the Byzantine tradition in Italy of religious art, and that's being left on one side and if you look here on this angel for example look at the expression on its face something that we would have not seen before so humanness is present in the artwork as well as volume in the figures one typical example that we always see in art history is a comparison of Cimabue which was supposedly Giotto's uh, teacher or at least he did study with him that well that artist we have on the right and on the left we have a piece by Giotto and if you compare both of them you can see that Giotto's Mary with child has much more volume is much more a uh, human whilst the one by Cimabue who was uh, a generation older is still very much uh, flat and Byzantine look at the, uh, the way that the different angels are basically stacked one on top of the other they all look alike while the angels on the, the Giotto piece are much more alive and this is what's going to bring in to us in terms of 
all the artwork. Now there's this idea that in the Renaissance the artists become so humanistic that they leave religion behind. That's not the case at all. All artists of the Renaissance that I know of, especially Italian Renaissance, painted religious pieces. There is really no going away from religion, but there is a new human aspect brought into it. For example, if you look here, this is the um, the burial of St. Francis, and we can see how there's this expression of anguish, of, of sadness, of pain in many of these images. And to compare, let me show you a piece of St. Francis earlier in the century before, where we see St. Francis in the center and his life all around him. That's a very different image, and that's what we would have seen in the Middle Ages, whilst we start to see a lot more human qualities in the Renaissance. Now we speak about Masaccio. So Masaccio was a Quattrocento artist and a generation after Giotto, but he is one of these early Renaissance painters and he gives Renaissance its name because he has rebirthed the ideas that come from the Greco-Roman times. And we're looking at the Holy Trinity that was created for the chapel, the Santa Maria Novella Chapel in Florence. There's going to be this rivalry between Florence and Milan and then Rome, but we won't get, get into that today. So this chapel in Florence has this painted by Masaccio and if you can tell there is a very exquisite use of architectural elements and that dome that you're seeing there is basically not a copy but it's reminiscing of the Pantheon of Rome. Let me show you an image for you to really see how this is a rebirth of Greco-Roman times if there ever was one. And there is a very well a thought out plan of perspective. So in Masaccio we start to see realism and naturalism not only in the expressions of the people but also in how the eye is viewing the image and how this idea of depth is brought into the piece. You can definitely see there's a lot of work in that sense and very different from what we had seen before in the, Ren in the Middle Ages. And another piece that I want to show you here is within the Brancacci Chapel and it's the life of Saint Peter. Now in this case, what I want to show you first is an image, uh, a Middle Ages piece of Mary, as you can see, and she is with child. And around her, just like we saw with Saint Francis in the image before of the Middle Ages, are moments of her life. And what you're seeing here are moments of St. Peter's life in Masaccio's terms, in a more humanist or more um, organic way to present art. It's no longer compact in different little scenes and it's trying to create realism. So again, we're going into the eyes and what Masaccio is trying to see is how would a person look at this piece and how can I create moments of the life of St. Peter through imagining how the human eye moves. So the first thing we see is the center, it's Christ, and he and Peter are both signaling to a part, to another part of the story. So the story is uh, very well known if you, I guess, know the Bible very well. It's when St. Peter is at temple and he is being charged. So it's the moment when Peter is being taxed at temple, Christ is with him, and then um, oblivious with what to do, Peter looks to Christ and Christ, Christ tells him to go fetch a fish and take a coin out of the fish's mouth. And what we see in the backdrop is that image that would have come after that. And then all the way to the right, we see when Peter is paying that tax. So these three scenes are presented organically as if uh, Masaccio knew how our eyes would have moved and also the idea of perspective or the vanishing point within this image is all focused from uh, the first point of, of Christ. So from Christ you can see different parts of the architecture and the imagery are coming uh, created from there. So there's when we talk about humanism and the idea that the sciences came into art, this is another example where it's not only about the beauty or the religious figures and ideas, but also how the artwork is presented. So the patronage system is very much present in most, if not all, of these artists of the Renaissance. You've heard of the Medici, the family, the great dynasty, but you've probably maybe heard of the Strozzi, the Albizzi, the Visconti, 
the Sforza or the Gonzaga, there were many families that were all very wealthy of the trade that they had made and they were creating more and more art to see. It was almost like a battlefield of the artist. Who could get the best artist to make his church or his chapel or paint his uh, dome? It was all about the system of having value within the arts, which we still work on today. Now, finally, I want to talk about Mantegna, who is another Quattrocento artist, and he is going to show us more pieces that I want to uh, focus on. We're back with the idea of the Renaissance, so the rebirth of the Greco-Roman pieces. And here you're seeing a Saint Sebastian, a very sexy Saint Sebastian, I have to say. And does he remind you of anything that we've seen before? Yeah, so he's a perfect example of a contrapposto uh, figure of the Roman and before that the Greek sculptures that we saw. So this idea of balance and perfection in the human body, in that S shape that we talked about earlier, is present, rebirthed in the Renaissance. Here, let me show you another artist of the same period that's doing another Saint Sebastian. It's very different. It doesn't have this Greco-Roman feel. But Mantegna was one of these amazing Quattrocento artists that really took on the study and the incorporation of the human body into his art. Another piece that I want to show you here is Christ. And look at the foreshortening. So we're seeing him from the feet towards uh, the head. And it not only shows us a perfect use of perspective of the human anatomy, but it also has an effect, a dramatic, a dramatic effect on us. So we're seeing Christ in the most fragile of positions, as if we were at the head of the bed, and as if we were mourning ourselves there. And it's an exquisite piece. It's, extra it's one of my favorite pieces of the Renaissance in general, because it really brings home all of the ideas that we've been looking at. And finally, the Camera degli Sposi. And here, we're back to the patronage system. This is paid for and is presenting the Gonzaga family, specifically the Pater Familias, which is also another concept that comes from the Romans. But the Pater Familias is Gonzaga, Ludovico Gonzaga III. So he's right there in the center. His whole family is there. And this whole camera or this whole chamber is painted in the best Renaissance style of the Quattrocento, but also showing us many reminiscent elements of the paintings on the walls of the Pompeian or the late Roman times, if you remember what we saw before. And look at this trompe l'oeil. We talked about the, um, the trick of the eye that loved, that the Romans loved. And here Mantegna is doing that for us, even to a greater degree that many of the Romans would have done, with showing us the, the oculus, oculus, oculus of of the ceiling and it's obviously just closed but we can see as if there was a, a ceiling of the sky. So did you take any notes? How do you take notes? I hope you did because next week we'll be talking about these ideas and developing them even further when we talk about Michelangelo and Da Vinci and Brunelleschi and perhaps even one more artist. And I want you to see these pieces of artwork today, which are basically notebooks of the great Leonardo da Vinci. So you probably have seen many pieces of da Vinci. Have you seen many of his notes? He was very well versed in terms of note taking. And next week we'll be talking about his work, especially his artwork. But I love to look at more than his paintings, his notes. Note taking is an art form. How do you take notes? So it's been a pleasure as always. The Renaissance has a lot to show us in terms of beauty and creativity. And join us next time when we speak about the great artists Leonardo and Michelangelo in depth and see what was going on in the Quattrocento and Cinquecento times of the great Italian peninsula. So see you then. And as always, make sure creativity is part of your day. Take good notes. See you soon. <laughs>